So the idea of this, uh, Ramsey and I, on a journey back from, uh, well, the, the airborne doings the other weekend, got into talking about rations uh, in the Second World War context and development of them and so forth, which was very interesting. So I thought it would be a good idea to perhaps run over that again uh, to camera and, uh, you know, get a bit of the details down, as I say, not in the most formal of settings. We'll probably cover some of this in more detail going forward because I know you're interested in doing some more videos, make, make some more videos covering ration details, but oh, it might be yeah, nice to do an overview. So uh, take it away, Ramsey. Well, I guess sort of the, we were talking initially about the BEF, obviously the very earliest sort of ideas, but obviously some of the improvisation that had to go on, uh, yeah. which led to further development. So I think it's probably worth starting a little bit pre-war from this point of view. So we'll talk about the situation from yep. about 1937 onwards. Sounds good. Um, I tend to say um a lot in videos, so you'll just have to excuse me on that one. Oh, that's <laughs> absolutely fine. Yeah, no doubt I do as well. It's just the, it's the brain processing things. <laughs> yes, <laughs> faster than absolutely. the mouth, mouth can actually say them. Right. 1937. The army had been in a peacetime scenario for quite a long time. Yes. Uh, obviously, ever since 1918, roughly speaking, in England, or certainly in Europe. So things have not really progressed amongst, progressed at all. There certainly wasn't really any thoughts about an upcoming war from a supplies no. and transport point of view. There's no, there's nothing in sort of colonial policing that would drive the development of that, or the kind of operations that were going on into war. Not really in Northwest Europe or something no. at this point in time. Um, there was a system that was in place. Um, it was, it worked and it worked quite mm -hmm. well. Basically what happens is that there was a prescribed um, ration scale that was laid down um, by obviously the War Department. Yes. And it was down to the messing officer of each unit to then order the goods that they wanted for their men. From that point of view, the scale itself was not set hard and fast. It no. was used as a it was used as a method to calculate the amount that the messing officer could spend. Yes. And, and you were saying that could be if they wanted to save a bit for a, a month to or, you know, to save up for a blowout, as it were, and have a special event and a special yeah. rations, they could they could scrimp and save for a certain amount of time and then spend more at another opportunity. Precisely that. So, if, for example, they had Christmas coming up, they could scrimp and save a little bit from October and November and overspend in December, mm -hmm. which for a peacetime army actually worked quite well. Yes. The downside is that obviously war started looming in 1939. Um, so it was pretty much all hands to the pump because just before the outbreak of war, um, the Royal Army Service Corps, as it was then, since it changed from the Army Service Corps to the Royal Army Service Corps, um, they pretty much had a reorganisation and a change in tactics. Yes. But that was just before the outbreak of war. Now, a lot of the army, uh, sorry, Royal Army Service Corps members at that point in time were reservists, territorials, yeah. mm -hmm. whatever you want to call them. They weren't, they had another day job, let's put it yeah. that way. So from that point of view, um, they weren't there to bring them up to speed on the latest practices. Yeah, restricted training, basically. Yeah. So changing all the doctrine just before the outbreak of war and just before mobilisation, certainly, was probably not the wisest of moves. No, no. This led to a massive knock-on effect when the BEF got over to France in 1939 um, because several things happened which made it a bit of a, a, bit of a mess. Yeah. Um, to start off with, um, the... The amount of rations build up before the war hadn't really gone ahead as planned. There was a massive delay from NAFI, who supplied loads and loads of the main goods that the British Army were to make, yeah. or to, were to use, sorry, at that point in time. They were very, very slow to get off the ground. Um, the War Department was relatively quick, so things like bread, frozen meat, that kind of thing, everything that the, Army, that the Royal Army Service Corps was um 
that was responsible for was there, was on time. Nappy was very slow off the ground. Now, bear in mind that we ordered probably 80% of goods from the Nappy organisation at that time. This proved a problem. So that, that that's the split, is it? Roughly 80% Nafi, 20% Service Corps provided? or It's difficult to know. It depends on yeah. what they've ordered. Yes, ah, of course, yeah, of course. Um, so they were, there was obviously this big problem that, you know, they got not got quite as many goods in stock as they thought they might like. Um, the other problem was that as they moved out and were mobilised, they were issued with, I think it was two days worth of rations mm-hmm. per man which was not uncommon at the time. No. Um, there was also two days of rations that was loaded onto unit transports. This was the plan anyway. Um, and then a further supply line that was meant to be coming over. The problem was a lot of units received their rations and decided to stow the two days worth of rations that was meant to be carried on the soldier in unit transports. Right. So you end up with all four days worth in the unit transport in Pretty much yeah. Yeah. now as that would have worked out perfectly fine if things had gone to plan because unit transports were meant to follow the men over not a problem yes. at the same time due to a last minute change in security procedures as the men were shipped out their unit transports were shipped on different ships and sometimes to different ports yeah which uh, led to a obviously a massive problem <laughs> if men arrived in france with nothing to eat and certainly for the first few days, this proved a massive problem. Hence why, you know, to get around this, they pretty much went out and procured what they could from the local populace. Yes. There's or even documented evidence that they had things like sugar and tea shipped in from Paris. Mm-hmm. But loads of local arrangements, loads of local stuff, um, local messing arrangements happening. And basically yeah. they just bought food off the locals. It's interesting because it, that that mirrors, from what I've read, mirrors quite a similar situation in the Great War of men going over and they procured food. And you would have thought that even that lesson of that time period would have been learned. But obviously, due to the last minute change, you know, you and so. not paying by what they were told to do as well, interestingly, and not keeping the rations on the men. So it just yeah. goes to show that, uh, yeah. I'm sure there are some exceptions. I'm sure there are some people mm-hmm. that procured food, etc. Um, but on the whole, most men arrived in France without any rations. Yeah. From what I, from the research that I've done on the subject, anyway. Best laid plans and all that. Yeah. Best laid plans and all that, as you say. Now, they it takes them a, a while to for everything to settle down. Um, at least a few days, sometimes even weeks. They mm-hmm. end up feeding men, sending men, uh, sending food forwards from the dockyards when it eventually arrives um, over by train to wherever the men are stationed at that point in time. Yeah. But it's very much a hand-to-mouth scenario. It takes them a while to actually build up stocks in the docks and they need they needed to employ quite a big um, labour force from the French populace to actually get this moving to yeah. bolster the numbers. Because, as I say, with the change in doctrine and the guys not knowing what was going on, um or not knowing the new practices sorry it took them a while to get up to speed yes literally and, training on the job yeah yeah and make themselves efficient for dockyard yeah, and for of course various bits and pieces um so from that point of view they move into again the phony war mm-hmm. um they eat field service ration scale and continue to eat that all the way up until pretty much it's looking desperate in terms of may 1940 yes so May 1940, um, sorry, there's a, there's a piece in between here. So it's, it's moving out to the Doyne, the Doyne River. Mm-hmm. So I know that we've discussed this before in terms of looking at the 37 pattern equipment manual. And that was obviously published in, was it 38 or 39? 30, I forget. 38, I think the manual, the, the, the fitting instructions are published, if I remember correctly. Yeah. yeah. So for the, um, for the, uh contents of the haversack it yes. says emergency ration yep now for what i've read the reason that we can't find any reference to the emergency ration before 1941 in terms of the yes. square uh you can probably see one in the case behind me if I yeah the oblong the oblong old tin yeah appears um, in one 
yeah. is because they call the, the what we would call an iron ration, the emergency ration. Yes. So when they moved out to the door and they took two days worth of preserved rations with them, they also carried one day's worth of fresh and two days worth again preserved in unit transports. Mm -hmm. So when they get out to the door, and they've got plenty of food, but then obviously what happens happens and they end up falling back. Um, and you read loads and loads and loads of accounts from that time period, from the retreating to the Dunkirk port of the men going hungry. Yeah, raiding, men, even raiding abandoned houses and nappy vans and things to try and find a bit of food. Totally. Yeah. Um, certainly when they get back up to the perimeter, there's loads of um, our, our Royal Army Service Corps vehicles and stuff. And you hear guys breaking yeah. in, and, you know, retrieving tins of jam and just um, I think there's one guy who said it was his birthday. So he managed to retrieve a, a tin of strawberries. Yes. Strawberry jam and a tin of cream. Because he says he always used to like having strawberries and cream on his birthday. Yes. Um, but certainly in terms of, you know, getting much else, there wasn't until the 22nd of May. Now, the 22nd, I think it's 22nd, I have to, I have to look back on over my documents again but i sent you the document as well that says did, yes. the army authorized Check. the air force to make airdrops of a new ration scale to france to the men yes um whether that was by parachute or whether that was by landing it i'd imagine it's probably by parachute i've got no idea of what the delivery looked like um but the scale is what they call ration scale E, BEF ration scale yes. E. And that was the first time a, a ration scale was produced. And what you saw on the ration scale is what you got. Yes. And that's 22nd of May, 1940. I was right for this uh, time around. Were absolutely. Um, now, that interestingly, that ration scale was also sent over by ship mm -hmm. um, for the guys just in time. In terms of just going back to the airdrop, how effective it was is difficult to know. Yeah. Uh, I've had a look through things like the Bomber Command War Diaries. Um, that I've got a copy of downstairs and I still can't see any mention of it. No. Which is interesting. But it's interesting. Again, this is a very much improvisation kind of on the fly. Very much you know, so, yeah. yeah. Very much so. So we know that they were being fed of a sort. There was new rations and stuff going in because they'd need to. They've got a force of 400,000 men sat yeah. there on the beach. So they need to they need to feed them somehow. And suddenly you've got all your RMC personnel and bits, you know, people that stay behind. And we know, yeah, quite how effective it was in terms of getting the rations to the men is difficult to quantify. Yeah. Um, but we know that when they got back, they were able to um, go via rail depots. And rail depots have been set up pretty much like mobile canteens. Um, I mean, they were feeding hundreds, if not thousands of men per hour as yes. they passed through on their way up north, away from the port of, um, or port of Dover or whatever they came into. And it was like a conveyor belt. Mm -hmm. They even managed to get people from... Uh, places like the school, London School of Cookery to come down to actually make sandwiches. Yes. Um, and the biggest problem they had was they ended up running out of mugs. So what you actually see is on the dockyards, when you see the photos of the guys in the railway carriages and stuff, they, yes. they have what looks like a polystyrene cup. Yeah. That's not actually polystyrene. It's a waxed paper. They're waxed yes. paper cups. Paper cups, yeah. Um, and to be honest, you know, most of the guys said, you know, they got fed fantastically well. They've got, you know, biscuits from Huntley and Palmer's and Crawford's yeah. and all those famous be uh, biscuit makers being handed out. Um, and there's a load more information I could go into there in terms of numbers and how many people they were feeding at the time. And yes. Who was doing so it and all that once, kind of once they got back to the UK, things were a lot, a lot better, obviously, because yeah. they, they'd kind of prepared for the evacuation to a degree. Yeah, very much so. Um, but it all kind of stems, the history of the rest of the war kind of stems from this opening chapter. Yes. Um, so yeah. From 1941 onwards, they start thinking, mm, we're going to have to invade Europe again at some point. We're going to mm -hmm. have to um, push the Germans back, obviously, you know, break down Fortress Europe. And that's where the start of the development 
into new technology really comes along. Yes. Um, because they suddenly think we're going to need to give the guys a portable um, portable ration that they can keep on them. Yeah. It's easy to carry. It's fairly condensed. should be fairly lightweight, which still gives them a fairly good nutritional value to it. Certainly in terms of, you know, thousands of calories a day because there was a study done um, probably around that time into how many calories an active infantryman burns yes. in a day. And it's, a, it's a lot. It's yeah. a lot, an awful lot. I'll try and get the figures to send over to you because yes. I haven't gotten quite to hand. Um, but it's it's thousands of calories. I mean, it's it must be about four and a half, five thousand calories. Ar- around day, four, like six that. to sit in my mind i'll put a pinned comment below anyway with any figures in that we we want to add yeah. i'll put a pin, pinned comment below the video with any figures that, that we want to add in sort of as a as a reference point yeah um, that, that aren't to hand immediately right now but uh, yeah um so as a result they got together and they came up with a couple of different ideas yes um i think do you want to just focus on northwest europe here because i mean stuff over in burma was going on at this precise point in time <laughs> Obviously, you've got exactly as you said, going in, on in Singapore. Yeah, you've got stuff that's going on in Iceland, the Faroe Islands. Europe's probably best for the minute because, as you say, it'll get a bit convoluted otherwise potentially. But I think yeah. focusing on the thinking behind reinvading Fortress Europe, you know, getting back into Fortress Europe and, and invading, and, and the need for rations for that's probably a, a good thing to focus on here. Okay, fine. Yeah. Well, we'll see what we get to then, because we might yeah. touch on some of the, the Far East stuff later on. Because it is quite interesting in terms of its development. But I am wary that this is going to take up quite a lot. It's quite a while, yes, yeah. So, yeah, you might have to bear with me on this one. We can always come back another day and and pick up on the other, you know, on the other bits and pieces as well. It would be great to have a chat about that too, even if we don't cover them today. Yeah, okay, sounds good. Yeah. Right, so 1941, they start thinking about new ration packs and stuff like that. Um, And you get the emergency ration tin at this time as well, the gold emerging. You do, yes. Yeah. They start thinking, up. OK, well, what do they actually need? The emergency ration tin, which I thought I had one out, but I don't. Uh, as, as I say, one in the case behind me gets um, invented. Um, it's basically a milk chocolate. It's not got any additives in, despite what people hear. The two different sources that I've come across from this are completely different. And one of them is the manufacturing spec. It doesn't contain anything else apart from just milk chocolate. Yeah. And cocoa. Um, that's it. Yeah. Um, but it's designed to sustain, you know, when the, the orders on the tin say something along the lines of to be open when no f- further food is procurable. Or yes, I forget the exact wording now, but it's, it's along those lines. Um, not only that, they also come up with the idea, as I say, with um, guys should carry their rations on them. Mm. They should be easily easy to get at, certainly not left in unit transports. Um, yeah. So they devise what they call the 41 or 1941 48-hour mess tin ration. Yes. Again, their thoughts are that 48 hours really is the crux time that um, we would need to um, create a bridgehead and use that to obviously establish a foothold in Europe. And then you have fresh supplies coming in and the men are no longer having to rely on the rations they have in the haversack is the idea. Sort of. Mm. Um, The next phase would be, and it's quite forward thinking this one, um, would be that there would be an easily transportable ration pack. Yes that is nice easy to use almost the equivalent of the quite complex field service ration scale um that is definitely palatable that would keep the calorie level up yes and so they decide to come up with the idea of the 14 man composition ration which again you start to see being manufactured in about 1941, and then it starts being issued in 42. Um, It actually gets issued in the desert first. Yes. Um, Now, bear in mind the guys over in the desert. I might be jumping around here, so apologies. The guys over in the desert had been surviving pretty much on preserved meat. Um, You know, there's the old saying, oh, it was only bully beef and biscuits for a while. 
uh, months, it seemed. Uh, I'm sure it seemed like years to some of them, but yeah, it was exactly. only months. <laughs> yeah. So once you've been on a diet like that, you kind of go, well, a 14-man composition ration, which is made up of loads of different ingredients, loads of different contents, um, seems like luxury. I'm Absolutely. sure it did. Yeah. And in fact, testament to that, um, once they moved over to 14-man compo, and then you know, they were forced to go back to field service ration scale, mm -hmm. there was considerable... Um, considerable what's the word force not force yeah. um opposition that's the word I was looking consternation for. shall we say yeah, yeah yeah to actually going back to it because they mm -hmm. were so well enjoyed yeah um so anyway i digress a little bit further away so mm. the idea is that you're meant to spend 48 hours on a on a man ration then you move on to almost section rations if you want to call it yes. that and then after that, you move back onto the full field service ration scale. Yeah. The whole reason for that is that the field service ration scale gives you more calories. It's a more balanced diet. Yes. Um, and you'll see that if you do any research into it across the board. I mean, just to touch on Burma really quickly, they reckon over, or certainly the research from the books say, and from the National Archives say that over 90% of rations that were issued in the Far East were for the, were from the field service ration scale. Yes. Now that's due purely to the fact it, it gives you much better nutrition and many more calories than any of the man pack or any of the individual rations, special yeah. ration packs, can give you. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. Well, for, as far as possible, fresh ingredients are best. Is would be the argument there. Yeah. Um, yeah. So they developed the forty one. Uh, 1941 um, 48-hour missing ration. They also develop uh, an armor fighting vehicle ration as well. Two, mm -hmm. three, and five man. Uh, came in a cardboard box pretty much. Um, was, from what I can understand, quite palatable. Um, obviously, these go into trial. The 48-hour missing ration goes into trial early 42. Yes. Um, they change and move things around. Originally, it had pemmican in it. Um, it had sardines in it as well, and it, co it came in a tin, which you might just be able to see behind me. Yes, which is this metal box just here. Um, it fits inside the larger portion of a mess tin, um, and is, as you say, the biggest pro the biggest problem with it is is it's heavy. It's tin plate heavy. You can't easily break it down to be a single day. Um, these are all negative stuff that came back from its field juice. I was saying this one because it has the the large tin of corn, well, the standard tin of corned beef, I suppose you'd say, in it, which is supposed to be split between two men. Yeah, so you need, you need an oppo there in order to. It's not really an individual ration in that regard. Uh, no, you exactly. have someone to share it with. Yeah. Um, so I think it's a 12 ounce tin of corned beef from memory. 12 ounce, yeah. Yeah, 12 ounce tin of corned beef from memory. Hang on. Um, can you see me all right? Because I might yeah, just absolutely. flick it off there for a second. Yeah, no, fine. Right, so uh, we've had the 48 hour misting ration. That's in use. That gets used uh, through Sicily um, mm -hmm. and certainly up into Italy. Um, just to touch on Italy and Sicily a little bit, there are um, accounts that they were fed with American food. Mm -hmm. Now, technically, that is true. But it was to a British scale. Yes. We had a load of delegates over in Washington. Um, and it was what, call, what was called the Washington Food Mission that went over that um, started looking at alternatives from an American food point of view that we could use for our ration packs. Yes. Um, there were various bits and pieces. We ordered quite a few from them. But one of the big things we did order was the M1 and M2, I believe, from the 10 in 1, um, or what they call it, well, almost like 10 in 1 combo. It's not 10 in 1 combo, 10 in 1 ration packs, anyway. Yes. Um, so, yes, at that time, um, stocks were being built up in the UK for Operation Overlord for D Day. Mm -hmm. um, so, we ended up shipping a load of stuff directly from America straight to yes. Italy. Hence why you end up seeing stuff like War Aid Battle Dress and yes, War Aid Great Coats and stuff popping up. And the KDs there. and things, yeah. Precisely, yeah. yeah. And um, that's, that's using American content to issued out on in, in equivalent scales to the British compo, basically. Yeah. yeah. What we did was send over the M&V, 
Um, yes. Reg, um, we sent that over as a specification to them and said, what have you got that's close to this? And they came back and said, well, we could probably produce that for you, but it'll take some time because we've got to grow different crops and stuff. And some of them don't grow quite well in our environment and various bits and pieces like that. Mm -hmm. So we've got these M1 and M2 um, contents or meat parts that we use for our in existence for our 10 in one rations. Uh, would you like those instead? So we went, yeah, OK. So we ordered them in there thousands sometimes in their millions from there and we got them shipped directly over to america directly over from america yeah so i mean it's worth noting just to jump around again um if anyone's trying to do research into what people ate at a certain time it's worth looking at where their supply lines came from yeah absolutely because for example um as we'll come along come on to it uh for d-day Certainly a lot of stuff for 21st Army Group was, despite, you know, no matter who they were, Canadians or British, if they came underneath 21st Army Group, they were supplied by 21st Army Group supply lines. Yes. Um, certainly for 6th Airborne, um, they got issued the same rations for D-Day that any of the rest of 6th Airborne got, got, um, got issued. Yeah. That includes Canadians and everybody. Mm-hmm. Anyway, sorry, I digress slightly. Not at all. No, it's fine. It's good. It's all good so, information. So what we've got from there, we move into 1942. They amend the 1942. They amend in very late 1942, early 1943, the 48-hour messaging ration. Yes. Um, they change the container on it. Um, it becomes almost like a key type. So... The best way of describing the key type is the same size as the, the one I have in the case behind here. Um, but it's almost like imagine the corn when you open the tin of corn beef, you've got that key that you roll back. Well, it's almost like a giant sardine tin about that size. Yeah, it? that's probably you the best. Roll the, yeah. turn, the, turn the lid back on it. Yeah. Yeah, you've seen the photos of it. So you yeah. just turn the lid back on it. And within there, you've got sealed contents. Mm hmm. Um, and hopefully that should make it a little bit fresher. The biggest problem with that is, as we've discussed in the past, was that it was very template heavy at the yeah. point in time where Britain couldn't really have that much template. Um, you know, it was being used for other things. Um, I mean, even the compo came into you know a massive amount of debate in terms of it being very template heavy, which yeah. is another reason why it doesn't get used you know, beyond um, certainly, was it D plus 42? I think yeah. it certainly moves over. Yeah. Well, that was the plan anyway. It makes um, sense, was to, as you say, is if you've got fresh rations that could be pack packaged in less durable materials than, yeah. than tin steel, then that's actually, as you say, from a raw materials point of view, is very much advantageous as well. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. So the War Department set out a... A, a request and they wanted a light not template heavy highly condensed ration pack for an individual to be able to use for 48 hours now it turns out they didn't actually get what they wanted but what they did come up with is the 24 hour ration yes which again does away with any template so you don't have that problem it's all very compact um i forget what the actual cubic um diameter or the cubic um volume is of a 24 hour ration pack but it's small very it small. small yes in fact there's an original one that you might be able to see just above my head here uh just about yes i think about we can just see the top of the box behind the yeah yeah so they're small boxes um well we've done i say actually both of the 48 hour mastin i'll put a cards up but we've, we've actually done a video we've made a video previously looking at a, a reproduction of the 24 yeah. hour fashion box yeah. well I'll link to that in the corner of the video people can go and see just as you say just how small it is really yeah um yeah well if you wanted a small snippet at some point don't forget i've got tea ration from it so true indeed you yes want to have a look at that at some point um, definitely uh we could do that i think we should get together some other contents of that as well because i know a couple of people that have got other contents of it original contents for it which is incredible yeah. to survive yeah. So, yeah it would be very interesting to have a look so you get the 24 hour ration um again that's very successful and as we know that gets issued two of each type of two um 
24 hour rations get issued to guys on D Day for Sick They're Born. Yes. They do the 24 hour ration assault, which is up, I've got the reproduction of up there. Yep, you can see that up there in the top left. Um, very rare. I've only ever seen one. Um, and that's in the Overlord, or is it the D Day Museum over yeah, in Museum. Normandy? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, very, very rare. Um, and they're slightly smaller, reinforced. Mm. Um, and they are designed to fit in the smaller half of the mess instead of the larger. Yes. As we've covered before in previous, um, previous videos. So from D-Day, that, uh, from D-Day, the invasion of, of course I'll call it D-Day, it should be Operation Overlord, really, because yeah. it's every single oh, operation Norman, for D-Day. The Normandy landing. <laughs> Thank yes. you very much, yes, that one. Um, so that pretty much sets the standard. You've got 48 hours worth of 24-hour ration packs, Yes. And then you get compo for the next uh, 42 days, I think it is from memory. Mm -hmm. And then they move on. And then by that point, they think, well, the mobile bakery should be set up. Yes, of course. So you get the mobile bakeries moving in. From that point, you move on to the three boxes that are called compo no biscuit. Yes. Um, and they yeah. then uh obviously they're, they're in place whilst you're able to provide able to get fresh bread the there are bread, yeah. separate biscuit tins that were issued alongside those um but they're designed really to have with bread and then from that point onwards you move into the field service ration scale again and that then gets supplemented with compo at various times during the war of course yeah yeah as as the situation dictates you're going to have yeah. necessarily have for say there's a, a local reverse or something the only stuff you can bring up might well be compo precisely yeah. um and there's a huge amount of information in terms of how um supply depots worked um and moving rations forwards actually getting rations up to the men at the front line yes you know there's a massive debate over in normandy whether they should allow men to cook their own rations or whether they should get them uh, cooked behind the lines and almost like a, a, a jeep does around or a 1500 yeah. or whatever it is does around robin to deliver rations to the men their conclusion is actually that they should let their men cook the rations themselves because it's actually better for their morale yes because it gives them at least some control over what's going on absolutely yeah um but certainly from the time in Normandy, of all the accounts I've read, there's only very rare occurrences that men are actually going hungry. Yeah. Service Corps had definitely got um, the supply lines and rations worked that well. And they had such a massive amount of backing from the supply chains, the lines of communication, yes. troops, et cetera, that guys didn't go hungry. Um, and you, you were know, saying that by, by this stage, you've moved, the RAC are dealing with all of it, the Royal Army Service Corps dealing with it, and the NAFI have been sort of sidelined from that point of view in the field. Or they've is been it... mostly sidelined, yes. Yeah. Um, they, the, the big problem was that because there was a massive reliance on NAFI, um, and bear in mind that it's, is it a commercial company? I guess it was almost could have been running the commercial company. Mm -hmm. There was a massive risk around it. Yes. Obviously, they didn't, in the early stages of the war, they didn't exactly um, endear themselves very well in no. terms of they were slow to get on board and stuff. And, you know, they were perhaps struggling for contents as well, because let's face it, in 44, there was pretty much getting on for being a food crisis in the world. Yes. Because all the food had been moved over to being uh, war uh, on a war footing. Mm -hmm. um, and they were pretty much... Everyone was struggling for getting various bits and pieces. Um, as you know, the the British scale of rations in terms of being at home have been reduced and reduced and reduced. Yes. Um, this had a knock on effect for what we call the home service ration scale, which came about in a, just after Dunkirk. And it, it reduced time and time and time again throughout the war. Everyone yeah. that was at home in the UK was put onto that scale. Um, and yeah, even they struggled to get various elements for that. Yes. And you're saying that that was reduced down to the, the fact that the soldier is basically in, in, in at home in the UK is being fed the same as a manual labourer in the civilian. Yeah. In the civilian world, as it so, were. There were factory canteens and yeah. there was a massive debate that was going on, certainly up to the House of Commons, 
to say that why is it, it, it it's unfair that an active soldier um, gets more food than a um, than a certainly a labourer or mm. a, a factory worker that's doing hard you know, manual labour. Manual labour, yeah. Now to add to this, the British Army in just flicking back to about 1937-38, one of their recruitment incentives was the fact that you would be well fed Yes. in the British Army. Now, by the time 1940-1941 comes around, they don't really need that as an incentive. No. So yet again, the ration scale gets reduced. Yes. It's, it's, it's pretty much... A, it's pretty much a um, story of reducing rations for a lot of the uh, scales that we see um, running across the board, uh, yes. certainly from 1940 onwards, as soon as civilian ration comes in for the general populace of the UK. Yes, to, to keep the soldiers who are in the UK basically in line with with, with the, the ration scale that civilians are getting. Pretty uh, much, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah and, and as I say, that gets even worse when you get around to about 1945 because a lot of people think oh by the time the end of the war comes around i'll oh, we'll move back yeah. to doing back to the same stuff that we had in 1937 38 and that was the case rationing got a lot worse in the post-war years absolutely as, yeah. as you say i think a lot of people forget that um, a lot of people forget yeah. that yeah uh right where was i so going back to normandy overlords mm -hmm. uh d-day um from that point of view a lot of it worked really well, worked incredibly well, and that pretty much set the standard for the rest of operations in Northwest Europe. Certainly yes. when you get around to Market Garden, guys were issued again two times 24-hour ration packs, yes. followed up by Compo, and I'm sure that actually if things had gone a, hadn't gone the way that they did, chances are it would have moved on to field service fashion scale at some point. The only yes. exception for this would be the bad weather they got around 44, 45 in the winter thereof, where... Um, quite a bit of compo was brought up because they struggled to transport quite a lot of stuff, you know, with the roads being bogged down. Oof. Pretty much the war grounds were halt in mm. about February 1945, January, February 1945, whilst they're over in Holland and um, Belgium and that kind of, well, moved on beyond Belgium, but moved on to Holland. Yeah. Um, so you see a lot of compo being uh, issued at that point in time. But certainly back to Operation Varsity in terms of crossing the Rhine, yes. the 24-hour ration comes up again, uh, again followed up by Compo, followed up by Field Service Ration Scale again. So the lessons learned were actually quite well implemented by the time you get by getting back into Europe and obviously the subsequent operations moving across Europe, whenever there is a large-scale assault where men are going to be removed yeah. from their normal chain of supply, actually the system does work quite well. It does, very much so, very mm. much so. And actually, if you think about it into the post-war years, it's actually, you know, you still get the 24-hour ration GS that comes yes. in. Yes. Um, and that's exactly the same principle, really. You're still feeding guys for X amount of time um, before you get more substantial rations brought up. For your supply lines, you know, as your supply lines are established, things start to get more... Um, more set in their ways pretty much yeah um, of course yeah and we see that in the post-war years as well and obviously compo becomes a staple for obviously modified but compo becomes a staple then for the british army going forward and obviously the the 24-hour ration obviously you end up with tins and so forth in it post-war the yeah. groundwork for that is is very much bedded in the second world war with the 24-hour ration then yeah very much so let's face it they are great field trials for it why yeah you know, you Absolutely. Know, active service. You can't get any better field trials than that. I've just been um, passing the note. One second. That's wonderful. Yes, please. Thank you. I've just been asked by note if, if Lucy should order us some food. So uh, that's, uh, well, you, can't, that's you can't talk in the background, darling. You don't need to pass the <laughs> notes. It's fine. You don't want to interrupt the stream. Oh, well, that's very kind of you. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not being your personal assistant today. No, so. true. You're not. Well, no, it's, it's a, a Skype conversation, not, so a it's live not a live stream. It's not a live stream. That may happen in the future with Alan as well. Well, we'll see. <laughs> Alan was keen on that. Idea. Yeah, but yeah. Uh, yes, so... And, and we were saying just to go into uh, just the very immediate post-war period, because we got into talking a little bit about the GS 24-hour uh, yeah. ration. That comes about in the 1950s, the early 50s, you were saying, or is it Did, late, very late 40s? It's difficult to pin it down. Um, mm. 
I've been discussing at great lengths with a lot of people um, about yeah. books. The earliest documented evidence I have for the, uh, for the 24-hour ration GS is, I think, 1952 or 53. Mm-hmm. That's in terms of specification. Yes. But that, I think, is Mark V. Right, yes, the Mark V, yeah, yeah. So whether that is... Um, Which remains standard for quite a long time, of course, the Mark V. Yeah, it does. Yeah. Yeah, it does. Um, now, whether there's a Mark IV, three, two, and one of the 24-hour Ash and GS, I don't know. I've never no, come across any not... enough documented evidence yet to say. Interesting. And, but, with the, and, and, and um, uh, go on, yeah, sorry. No, after you. Just, just with the 24-hour ration again, is but you did say, I remember we were talking about um, immediate post-war period airborne training and a CLE, was it a CLE full of, yeah, a photograph was, of a, CLE, a a container light equipment full of 24-hour rations in, in post-war airborne training, yes. immediate post-war, in the late 40s. Immediate, yeah, talking late 40s, I think it's 48 from memory. Um, they do... Uh, three years, yes. Um, of... CLE containers, they they pack them full of 24-hour rations. So I think mm. 60 rations in a CLE container with fuel tablet tins from memory. Yes. And they also trial drop a uh, one of the new 10-man ration packs. So they move over at some point. Again, I've been unable to ascertain what's the actual year, but they move over from the 14-man to the 10-man ration pack. Some point, yeah. maybe 46 or 47. But yeah, I'm yet, yeah, yeah. the only thing I've ever seen on that point of view is a 47 dated crate. That's definitely yes, 10. Yes, we were talking about the other day. Yeah, yeah, yeah which is a yeah. 10 man. Yeah, it's yeah. interesting because, as you say, that's that sort of hazy. You, you, you've traced a huge amount of the, the development during the war. And then there's that hazy period where there's almost a gap in the sort of late 40s where then you jump into the stuff that's quite familiar from the 50s, which obviously a lot of viewers who are veterans will actually know of later on because it was, a lot of it yeah. was used for a long time of course and slightly modified over the years but yeah definitely, definitely. yes um, so yes but it is interesting as you were saying is that that um the the impetus is always to get back onto the field service ration scale as much as yes. possible and, and feed men fresh food in the field yeah um in fact they just before the war they appointed new directors of nutrition of health mm. and stuff like that um, to come up with these new ideas and check the army ration packs and there's a huge amount of uh, correspondence going on checking levels of vitamin c levels of vitamin d a oh, B, yes. stuff like that to make sure that the guys are getting enough um, and suddenly you'll see a load of papers come out um, because somebody's decided that for example um, a marmite. marmite yes is an interesting one because there was a massive amount that was done and um, looked at during the war as to the actual vitamin d content of marmite i think it's 1941 from memory on the documents suddenly it's found it doesn't contain as much vitamin d as people think it does ah right okay interesting so they actually move over and they uh they go for i think it's vegemite mm-hmm uh, basically, they move they move away from marmite as being uh, uh, the recommended um, vitamin D content, meat extract substitute, whatever yeah. you want to call it. They move away from that because the rival contains it, it contains more vitamins Better. in it. So yeah. they move over to that. Um, so actually, yeah. as you say, it's not a just a, there is some trial and error as we've talked about, but yeah. a lot of it is actually very scientific in terms of making sure the nutrition is there, yeah. making sure the calories which are provided are as stated and the vitamins and so forth as well. Yeah. Very. Um, yeah. Very. Which is, you, you blooming hope there would be because obviously it's <laughs> the men's health is, is largely dependent, you know, aside from disease and so forth is very much dependent on, on the food they're getting and the, the, you know, not having um, uh, deficiencies in, the, in their diet. Uh, yeah. So, and I'll just if I can just link into that very briefly because I'm not sure if I'll have, I'll have uploaded it already or whether it will have been uploaded. There will be a video looking at some some of the late war Pacific ration that what we believe to be a sort of vitamin C substitute of lemon drink, which is quite yeah. an interesting thing to have a look at to make sure men are getting it's a substitute for fruit juice essentially. 
Um, so that will yeah. be an interesting thing to have a look at. Um, yeah, yeah. I don't know if that I don't know if that will be up before this or after this, but it, it'll have been seen or will be seen by people watching this, hopefully. Um, okay. Which is quite an interesting experience. I'm very grateful to you for sharing that with us. It was uh, yeah. it was good. <laughs> well, it wasn't very nice tasting, but it was interesting to do. Yes. Yeah, it was good fun. Good fun. It was good fun. Absolutely. Um, so, would you be okay to talk a little bit longer, or do you need to be sort of? How are you doing? We've been going three quarters of an hour. If you need to have a break and stuff, and we could come back to the Pacific stuff and and maybe more of the desert, uh, you know, the what was going on in the desert at another time, or if you're happy to keep talking, we could cover a bit of it now. It's up to you. I think we should probably leave it there, there for the That's minute. absolutely fine. It. It's going to be quite a long time. Certainly, if it I'm is. watching one of these things, you know, 45 minutes is about my attention span. Yeah. Yes. Um, yeah, good, I'm usually itching to go on to go and do some more work on the house because I'm busy redoing the house at the minute. Uh, so. Ramsey is busy re redecorating the house. Absolutely. Well, thank you yeah. very much for giving us that time, Ramsey. It's been really no, good having right. a chat to you about the the ration yeah. and, and the de the development is the interesting thing. The evolution is is fascinating to see uh, and uh, you know coming up with solutions to problems. Yeah. Um, so, um, I'm sure I've got some more examples of various bits and pieces. There should be some more technical information and stuff there as well. Absolutely. Um, and obviously, we can always dip into looking at some of the stuff behind in the case if we want to at some point. Yeah, definitely. Going forward, that would be excellent. Yeah. Well, thank you very much What's, indeed once again. What would be really interesting to do would be actually mm. the, the development of tea throughout the war. Yes, which we've covered a little bit. We've covered yeah. a little little bit in the uh, in the previous videos looking at the, the 48 hour and the uh, the 24 hour rations but yes it would be definitely be good to talk more about that it's quite an it's quite a it's quite a good shorthand for the development of things overall really isn't it the, the it is pretty much yeah because you, you just go into it's, it's convenience more than anything absolutely pure convenience yeah absolutely well definitely and in, include in that perhaps the original tea, t tea uh, tablets you have from the 24-hour russian box that yeah, be, let's have a look, yeah. yeah all stuff for the future excellent it is thank you very much indeed ramsey that's been absolutely welcome, brilliant Simon. and we'll have no a problem. chat again at some point in the future about uh, more on rations yeah sounds good nice one thank you very bye. much indeed bye for now bye